Welcome to episode 23 of the Go Get Em Agility podcast. My name is Margaret Hughes, and I'm your host, along with my daughter, Emma Hughes. Hi, Emma. Hi, everybody. I wanted to clarify two things from prior podcasts. Or not clarify. One I want to clarify, and one I want to give you a little tip. So the first thing I want to tip you on is that if we talk too slow, some podcast feeds, so like iTunes, you can listen to us on Google Podcasts, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, blah, blah. There's a whole bunch of them. And on some of them, if we talk too slow, you can actually listen to us in one and a quarter time or one and a half times. So you can speed us up if you find that we're talking too slow, or if you find that you only have a certain amount of time and you want to go from 30 minutes to 20 minutes, you can kick us into high gear and listen to us a little bit faster. So I often do this, not only re-listening to us, but um, so I re-listen to us just to, you know, make sure everything's cool on the interwebs. Um, But I also, other podcasts that I listen to, sometimes the presentation is, is just slow. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is so slow, but I really like the information. And so I will listen to other people in one and a quarter time or one and a half time. There's that advice tip for you for listening to podcasts. My other thing is that we talked about at the end of, I think it was two podcasts ago. It was in episode 17. At episode 17, right around minute 32, we were talking about how people learn. And it just came across my my Facebook feed. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, D-U-N-N-I-N-G, C-R-U-G-E-R. And it's the confidence versus knowledge in the field uh, effect. And so it, if you uh, are struggling with where you're at in agility and you kind of want to have a, a sense of why things feel weird to you or why you have confidence or lack of confidence, Uh, in agility, go look up the Dunning-Kruger effect and see if you can put yourself somewhere on that um, scale. Any opinion, Emma? Um, No, actually, I I agree with both of those. I was going to add that uh, for the speeding up of the podcasts, I do that with my uh, professor's video lectures all the time because she speaks quite slowly and so I'll speed it up. Uh, (laughs) So yeah, there's no shame in the speeding up game in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's a good tip. You know, we're, uh, it, we want the information, but sometimes it can be tedious. I want to talk a little bit about Eli. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about what may be a puppy issue that's happening in, in my training and what may be a, a, a picture, a, a video reel of things to come, right? So if I have an issue, is that a puppy issue or is it of things to come? Does that make sense? Yeah, is it like, are you breaking, are you going to break the habit eventually or is this just a puppy growing pain? Right, and I can- Like ankle biting. (laughs) Right, exactly. So like if I ignore it, will it go away on its own? Like teething, like teething. So ankle biting- and biting my hands in play are two totally different things. And one is a puppy thing that yes, I can make it worse. And one is a preview show for what's to come and will get worse if it's not addressed. All right, so let, yeah, let, and let's use biting because that is such a good, that is such a good one. And, and why does it uh, affect us in agility? Because here's why uh, we need to make sure we put that chime into agility. So puppy biting, when you're just petting your dog and they turn around, they try and gnaw on your hand. A lot of that is puppy stuff and redirection of into, you know, onto a toy or redirection, um, you know, onto something that's appropriate or potentially even giving the puppy a timeout for a really hard bite is normal puppy stuff. It's normal for a puppy to put their mouth on you. It's normal for them to bite down hard at times. And 
socialization or puppy um, uh, dog to dog biting and mom staying with mom until and staying with the litter um, through some of that early six week to eight week is vital. And so between five to eight weeks of age, even starting at four weeks, mom will, the nursing part of the relationship between puppy and mom, that is when mom teaches, starts to teach them bite inhibition. And so she will allow them to nurse on her from time to time, but will also start to instruct them, you just bit down on my nipple way too hard and she'll correct them. She'll um, you know, somehow tell them either by getting up and leaving or by giving them a little muzzle um, wrap that you just bit down too hard, soften that bite. And when puppies are playing and jaw wrestling, they will do the same thing. And so this, this ability to learn how to moderate your bite is crucial to adulthood. And if and when a dog does get into a fight with another dog or with a human, the damage or lack of damage that they cause is that bite inhibition. So bite, bite scales are, if I remember correctly, it's um, one to six. One being an air snap, and they they snapped at you, but they did not make any contact. And six being maiming, killing. So there's a whole range of bite levels within that. And where we want our dogs, if they're going to bite, is somewhere between a one and a three. So four starts with stitches and, you know, deeper wounds that require intervention from either a vet or a doctor and three being yeah i felt the bite they caused an indentation but no stitches are required and so that three to four break is it, for me for me personally back when i was doing aggression was whether or not i could take a case or not okay so is the insurance of do we have a known biter how bad was the bite did it require stitches and whether or not i could accept a, a bite dog into my um into my practice or in, you know i'm not a vet but i feel like a practice is more veterinary based but no yeah, but i mean you were certified for yeah, it and everything I'm, I'm a certified dog trainer and and uh certified in, in aggression and um and so anyway, but my insurance that I held at the time there, that was the breaking point was, you know, how, how severe of aggression is it? And how much did I want to um, do as far as um, I didn't, I didn't want to deal with dogs that had killed other dogs. So I did not purchase the insurance that allowed me to do that. Um, so anyway, getting back to bite inhibition and teaching our puppies bite inhibition that that part of puppyhood is important and it's crucial for us to have actual physical contact with our dogs so that we can gauge as puppies when they don't have the the strong jaw pressure but they do have the sharp pointy teeth that puppy time is a crucial time to teach them bite inhibition and also at the exact same time gauge how much bite inhibition they have so with Eli um, right now, he's been doing just a ton of jaw wrestling with Jinx, which is awesome as well to teach that bite inhibition. And he tells Jinx and Jinx tells him when that bite pressure was too much. And so the, the game ends or they get a little snarky with each other. Jinx gets up and walks away um, or he corrects him, you know, with a, a strong muzzle wrap and, you know, says, hey, whoa, dude, that was too much. But I also do one on one play with me and so i will have a toy and playing you know tug playing um just jaw wrestling stuff with a, a toy and tradings in and out of of the toy and if he misses the toy and strikes my hand that is my 
chance to gauge where his mouth is at, right? So his job is to try not to grab my hand, but if he does grab my hand, how much pressure does he put on? My job is to know the pressure level that I will accept and the pressure level that I won't accept and to give him that information of when it's too hard or when it's soft. And, and so, and I give him a, 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 a information through either a, ouch, that hurt and a little time out or I keep playing. So, the, you know, hey, hey, dude, don't touch my hand, but let's keep playing. So what's my point on this? Um, uh, ankle grabbing. Uh, does it hurt? Because I think um, I'll butt in here, I guess, from my own personal experience. Um, so Dottie's an ankle grabber, um, always has been, and I feel like she always will. Um, but it never hurt. So when she made contact, especially in the summer when all I was wearing was like socks and there's no pant leg, um, she used to go for the pant leg, right? And then it slowly turned into she would just go for the ankle. She just grabbed my skin. But she never actually bit down. She just kind of put her mouth around my ankle and made a lot of noise. But she never actually drew blood. And so that is why I allowed it to continue because it didn't hurt. And I thought it was funny. And she's tiny. Um, I think it would be different if you had, say, a German shepherd that did it to you. Um, that would probably be a little bit less fun. Um, just because they are bigger and you can't like, you know, move out of the way and stuff. Um, and so it really depends on your um, criteria and how much you're willing to let your dog get away with. And obviously if they are ankle biting and they are drawing blood or it's hurting or you just don't like it, that is something that you need to work on. Uh, because as Dottie has shown, yes, it started as a puppy, but it's continued well into her adult years. And that is, it's just something that hasn't stopped. Yeah, but, so, the, yeah, but you're talking to me. So I, I hear what you're saying, but there is still a difference between the behavior that Dottie was giving you and redirected frustration. Right. Okay. So yeah, she, that's it's play, start, isn't it? Dottie may have started out as, frustration but it didn't continue as frustration no that is true um so there's a difference there mm -hmm. and she also would stop and redirect easily yeah yeah okay, so she I agree didn't come back and bite you again come back and bite you again come back and bite you again when yeah. you told her all right enough we're done yeah that uh, is true yeah, and, there's and hers was very much based in hurting, mm -hmm. not frustration. Right. Um, and I'm not coming on this podcast to say, hey, if your dog ankle bites, you should let it happen. Because I think the majority of people don't like it and they don't want their dogs to do it. And it is kind of hard. Um, especially if you're like a first time herding breed owner or if you're like getting a border collie or something where it's a little bit more intense because it's a border collie or like a German shepherd or something. Um, it's a little bit harder to tell if it's play or if it's frustration. And so I if I got another dog, I don't think I would allow them to ankle bite me regardless. Um, and especially if they're doing it on course, like that's not OK. I will not allow Dottie to ankle bite on course exactly. or in so, training. So she did it in two places in agility. Um, she did it. So and this was frustration. This yes. was um, redirected frustration, redirected. What you're asking me to do is too stressful. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm going to put it on to you. And, right. and I do remember you shutting it down as quickly as you could, even though in the house, you didn't mind it. Right. But on the course, <laughs> on the course, you definitely were like, no, 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 that is not acceptable. So she learned the difference between in-house tugging on your foot, right, on your ankle, tugging on your socks versus we're working now in agility. I, I agree. And I think that also there are uh, other signs that you can watch for. So if you have like, say, a long sweatshirt on that the sleeves come past your hands and if your dog goes for the ankle and you're like, hey, stop that. And they come up and they grab at your sleeve yes. or they grab at your shirt or they grab at, you know, if you have like a treat bag, like, you know, those cute little tote bag things right. or um, they tug, grab at that or a yeah. tug up so in your pocket. 
if you say, hey, buddy, don't do that, and they come up and they do, try to do something else, that's frustration, right? That's not play, because if it was play, they'd be like, oh, man, okay, let's do something else. But frustration is they, you know, dogs are are very complicated creatures, and so they can't figure out where what to do with this frustration, because they don't understand what you're asking, and so they'll just kind of bite at things, um, and that's probably your shirt, or, you know, your pants, or, you know, whatever, right. So, yeah, there are also signs. Dottie never did any of that, so that's why I didn't worry. Yeah, and and the ability to to learn how to work for a tug is different than working and give me the tug. Right. There's a difference, and you got to be careful when you are toy training, especially with a puppy, the the obstacle doesn't immediately equal the toy every single time because mm-hmm. you'll create this repetition of obstacle toy obstacle toy and so what you end up doing is not so much training the obstacle focus you're training obstacle immediately into handler focus and that that can cause more frustration when you don't give it to them. So now you're asking for multiple obstacles in a row and bam, they're like, I can't do it. The tug. Right. They just like kind of, they have to have the tug, right? Because you taught them three obstacles tug or two obstacles tug. And part of that ends up with them beating you out of an obstacle, right? Mm -hmm. So they're already starting to wrap and curl back into you. So rather than causing a tripping hazard, people pull out the tug and say, okay, go on to this instead. Right. And yeah. it just creates this um this snowball effect. Yeah. Where you get way too much handler focus mm-hmm. because of placement of reward, because that they have to come back to you for the tug. Yeah. And you can see I think the most obvious obstacle you can see it with just because the bars come down is jumps. Right. And so let's say you're kind of behind your dog. Right. Um, And they come out of a tunnel, say, and they curl into you and they look at you. And if you don't have like a go on cue or if your dog just doesn't know the jump. Right. If they're a puppy, they'll just kind of look at you and you're like, hey, go over, go over. And they just kind of back up with you until you're like right on top of the jump. And then they're like, oh, okay, that's what you wanted. Then they jump and then they expect the toy again. Right. And And this is is one of the dangers of puppy training agility. I mean, so let's, let's set set aside all the physical problems with teaching agility to a puppy too young. I mean, there's so many problems I see when, when people are looking at training puppies for equipment. I mean, for Mm -hmm. actual equipment, like jumping, like a frames like dog walks. I mean, even small, small dog walks. You know, they they have um like uh, what what is it called? Um, a contact uh, clip trainer. and go does one. Yeah. Well, oh, have, I know what you're talking about. Yes, yes, contact yes. trainers. Yeah. They have uh, the teacup. Um, that's right. Are yeah. much smaller. Um, so even though height wise, like oh, okay, it's not the greatest thing. Um, there's so many bad habits that can ar- arise trying to teach puppies for a host of reasons, but one of which is their inability to focus forward yet. They can't physically, they haven't learned. They, they're just not enough time. There's just not enough um, uh, uh, mental capacity mm, on the puppy's yeah. part to be able to handle focus forward. They just like don't putting- have that knowledge. Right. It's like putting a toddler in like a Formula One car and you're like, all right, go on the track and go win. Well, let, let's you know? go. It's like you can't have to get go. a car thing in there somehow, right? Okay. So you went from kindergarten to, to uh, college. Let's go even kindergarten to middle school. You mm, can't take yeah. a middle, a kindergartner or even a first grader and say, hey, start reading this because right. you're so freaking smart. And that's right. the problem is that they can show elements of smartness like border collies right so Mm. all of our herding breeds there's just people love them in agility because they're so freaking smart they're good guessers i mean my little dude picked up the word potty within like week 10 i mean so two weeks with me and he started peeing on cue it's like yeah you are so freaking smart (laughs) he's a good boy and so 
but and so you get this false sense that I can keep going in agility with him because he's already showing me such amazing signs of of his ability to move faster. And so as a, a puppy owner, I have to be very, very diligent in how much I push him and how fast mm. I push him because he's reckless in his body. He doesn't have, not reckless, that's the wrong word. He's actually a very good body dog. Um, he's, he's already very aware of his, his hind end, but not to the point that I need him on a dog walk, not right. to the point where I need him um, on even, a, even jumping, like being able to wrap a jump stanchion. He just wants to flail himself if I allow him around mm-hmm. these jump stanchions. And it's the mental capacity to be able to handle all this work. Yeah, I think it's physical too, because um, especially with dogs like Border Collies, you know, you see, oh, smartest dog in the world. And I disagree with that. I don't think any dog is smarter than the other, but I do think that Border Collies are A, very, very good at guessing, and B, very, very good at repetition. Love and repetition. So Love it. They will just go and go and go. And I remember when Jinx had a cut on his paw or something, and we were doing an international seminar with him, and he was literally bleeding up and down his leg. And he's like, okay, let's do go again. So they won't tell you that they're hurting. And this um, kind of goes with jumping a puppy. So any dog under a year, it doesn't matter how high that bar is off the ground. You know, even if it's like four inches, you know, I mean, that repetition, they will not tell you if it hurts. That's right. I um, remember. Border Collies, I remember. German Shepherds, um, all these big breeds, they won't yeah. tell you if it hurts. I remember that seminar and I remember seeing blood on the turf and I'm like, yeah, whoa, that's from my dog. He yeah. never gave me any indication that his paws, his pads were were tearing up. Zero indication. I wasn't used to running on turf, and so I didn't I didn't understand how the turf ripped up their paws. I sure do now. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, dude, you're not even limping. He was no. just like, I'm doing it. I'm going. I love this. Yeah, yeah. Border collies are crazy. That's what that's what a lot of the herding dogs will do, uh, and that's not to say that other breeds won't do it as well of course not yeah they they sure can have some high high repetition dogs in other um in other groups yeah i think it's just like they just won't tell you if they hurt and so if you're jumping a puppy say or you're doing high impact sports this could go for anything right for frisbee for jumping for uh even dog diving yeah, but you even know, obedience, were... just high, high focus on a heel pattern right? with yeah. a young puppy. Yeah, it's so they just can't handle it, but they won't tell you that they can't handle it. Let's go back to jumping with puppies and even just having a bar out on a jump stanchion. So I personally don't even introduce bars to adult dogs until they have a clear understanding of what a jump stanchion is Mm, right so in my foundation class i don't think we get to a jump stanchion until week three week four and that's because in the beginning we're working just going around something just going around a cone and teaching the dog a little bit of, of obstacle focus and then i also teach a lot of people that have never been in the agility world and we're teaching handler skills as well. And so we're c- combining these two disciplines of dogs learning how to go around something and then also handlers and then combining the two together. And so we don't even get to a jump stanchion till week four-ish. And then I don't put bars on until we really start, I really start to see the handlers are understanding their job. Because one of the things about bars, and one of the reasons that bars get knocked and jump stanchions get knocked is because the dogs are in too much handler focus. And the dog is required when they are working a jump, they're required to look at the bar for a second. Even if it's for a split second, they're required to take notice of where the bar is in order to lift appropriately. And if they're still looking at their handlers, 
then the bar is just something to get stepped on. So let's look at Cavaletti's. So Cavaletti's is a series of low bars on the ground. If you're expecting your dog to do Cavaletti's with their head up, then it's like going from boulder to boulder across a river without looking down at the boulders. Yeah. Right? Scary. Like, just take a guess and step and don't hit the river. Yeah. American right? Ninja Warrior, but, like, yeah. it's with a puppy. <laughs> but in Ninja Warrior, they're not having to look at the announcer. No. No. Right? They're looking yeah. at the obstacles. And yeah. Because you'll roll your ankle. Right. Yeah. And it's like the same thing. I remember when Dot was very young, I put bars on the ground. So not even at two inches or four inches, I literally just on the ground. And I thought, oh, yeah, I need to teach her what a bar looks like. Right. And I remember you came out and you said, well, no, don't do that because you're going to roll her ankle. And it's yeah. very true. Right. The, I mean, puppies, they have such tiny strides. Right. Um, They're looking at you. They're in handler focus, you know. And every time a dog knocks a bar, every time, you know, if you're your puppy looks at you and they step on that pole and it rolls because it's round. Now you've just rolled an ankle and it's like, oh man, now I've got to fix my puppy. That's like, you know, under a year. Yeah. The and, only, yeah, yeah. The only, the only positive to going over bars is just not to become afraid of PVC. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, that's Don't go only... underneath the bar, but like there's plenty of time for that later. Yeah. I mean, and how I'm teaching it for Eli right now is that when I do set bars for, you know, my students, is yes, he's with me on a leash or I'm feeding him and I'm setting with one hand and holding him on a cookie with the other hand. So I've got a cookie in his mouth. And so I'm just manipulating the bar next to him, but I'm definitely not using the bar as a jumping opportunity. It's just hang out next to stuff that moves, hang out next to things that uh, may have a different sound to them or, um, that, you know, I accidentally kick next to you or I drop it next to you. You don't have any reaction to that because I'm socializing you to it, not because I'm training you on it. Yeah. In terms of puppies, I mean, agility is the, you know, last thing you want to do, right? It's like, who cares about jumping? They've got 10 years of their life to learn how to jump. They've I... got 10 years of their life to learn contacts. I mean, you retrain Jinx's contacts at the age of seven, Yeah. right? Right. So let me just talk about contact. So one thing that, that, you know, again, dogs not having skill set, and this is hard for adult dogs, but it's even dangerous for puppies. And that is, again, going back into handler focus, right? So the dog should be an obstacle focus when they're going over a contact because they need to look at the obstacle. But when they're ascending or, or sorry, descending on a contact obstacle, if they start looking at you and expectant of a reward or a tug or the end of the game, or even that they're just beating you. So if they're beating you over the contact, natural tendency is to start curling into you. Going straight on a contact is a trained behavior. It's not natural. It's a trained behavior to go straight on a contact. So natural tendency of a puppy is to start curling into you. And now they're coming down the A-frame sideways. That is so bad for the shoulders. That is so bad for the shoulders. And what do they do when they get close to the bottom? They jump. So now they're not only jumping, which they shouldn't be doing, that's not you know natural out in the on a walk jumping. If you're manufacturing the jumping, you're putting stress on the body parts that should not have stress. So they're jumping but they're also jumping sideways. Mm, you yeah. are killing your dog's shoulders. You're killing Not, them. Yeah, their and that's on just... Their, their ankles, their mm. wrists, all of it. Yeah, and that's on the, you know, on the A-frame. And if your dog turns on the A-frame, you can kind of get away with it, right? I mean, it's obviously very, very bad for the dog, but, you know, they've got a lot of room um, to move around on. But I, I oh, always so physically, remember, yeah. Yes, physically, Um. But if your dog is on the dog walk, and even if their head turns, when dogs' heads turn, their butt moves in the opposite direction. That's right. And so they always spin to look at you. So if your or, dog or, even thinks... Yes, not even necessarily spin, but they rotate and they drop that right. back far foot off. That right. That them 
to yeah. fall off. So if your dog looks and at God you, forbid um, you have anything underneath your dog walk. <laughs> right. When you're right. doing this, I your used dog to start jumps on the dog themselves. walk. Oh, you know, you kick yourself in the years to come. Um, and you know, and so when your dog looks at you, goes in, you know, for whatever, when you're training the dog walk, all of a sudden their back feet are coming off, and all of a sudden your dog's just flipped over backwards. Um, and you can even see it happen with experienced dogs. Millie did it once um, when she had been doing, you know, perfect, perfect dog walks for the first 10 years of her life. Looked at me once, back end came off, she flipped off backwards. Yeah. Um, I mean, she was okay, luckily, but that is not something that you want to continue on in your, um, it's not something you want to start as a puppy and then allow to continue on as they get up to the dog walk that is literally, what is it, four feet off the ground? That yeah. is a long, long fall for a dog. Yeah. It's a, yeah. And, and if you're under eight months. Uh, yeah. Good gracious. Eight months, you're just causing problems. You're causing problems for the future. I'm not yeah. saying that we don't set our dogs up for skills. I mean, there, there's the camp of, of folks that, you know, just let them be a puppy, just let them be a puppy. And I'm, I'm a little bit for that. But I'm also for, well, okay, but I can install some behaviors that are going to benefit me in the future, right? I don't have to, I don't want to do overkill on them. Like I want to introduce them and get just a little knowledge in there so that I can utilize that in the future. But I don't want to hammer it. I don't want to do it every single day where it becomes not only boring and repetitious, um, but it becomes physically dangerous, right? F physically, I'm manipulating how my dogs are working their bodies. And I need to be careful of that. And, and again, it's tough because Eli is showing so much promise right now. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to get further down the line, right? I can't wait to see where we are a year from now. And, but I'm not in any hurry to get him onto that start line the minute that he turns of legal age. We may be there, we may not be there, but I'm not in any hurry to establish agility because he physically wants to do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of things that I can introduce him to that will benefit me in agility that's not actual agility equipment. Yeah, there is a false, I think we talked about this in a previous podcast, um, there's a false um, sense of, of agility training that goes around, I think, um, obviously you guys might disagree, but I, I really do stand by this, that everybody always thinks that agility is jumps. And so if your dog can jump, your dog can do agility. And it's like, well, wait a minute, let's, let's go back to foundations, right? Because agility is not, in my opinion, agility should not be about getting by. So if you come off a course and you're like, oh man, we just got by, but that's the sport of agility. I, I, I very politely disagree with that. And so if you are training your puppy and you're like, oh, well, you know, she can do three jumps in a row. It's like, well, well, that's not agility. That's just your dog going over a jump. You know, can they do it quickly, right? Can they do it safely after they are, you know, say 18 months? Can your dog do it after 18 months? That's when you start to worry about jumps, right? And like teeters and whatever. When you're like, okay, it's 18 months and they're not they're not doing great. Um, and But then that goes back to your foundations, right? It always right. leads back to foundations. It's like, so why isn't my dog doing well? Well, because they don't have foundations. Yeah, and and relationship. Right. right. So there's there's over handler focused, right? And and so yeah. and you really have to be aware of placement of reward and when you reward and how you reward and what you're actually rewarding, right? You need to try and prevent that frustration from arising through clear training and training things that the dog is understanding versus just doing equipment for the sake of doing equipment right you've got so much right? time to learn oh and there's so much beauty in watching them clearly understand their job right right there's so yeah. much understanding or beauty in that i just when yeah. i see the light bulb go on for eli I'm blown away because I yeah. love the train. I think maybe that's the difference between some trainers uh, and, and layman people is that I love 
the learning process, even if what the behavior that I'm getting is really junky right now, like, oh my gosh, that is not the end behavior that I want. I love the little micro learning curves that happen when I am trying to get to a behavior that I do want. Right. You can see the finish line. I know what the finish line is. And I know that the finish line requires me going through the entire alphabet. Right. To get there. I can't jump from A to Z and on most stuff, there has to be some, especially complicated technical skills that I'm, I'm requiring and skills that compound on each other. Right. Right. And so right now I'm not asking for compound behaviors. I'm not asking my dog to transition from a, a, a stay position into obstacle focus multiple times yeah like right? a, you know like oh let's do six obstacles in a row you know like that's right. that's like, hard no just walk next to me <laughs> right be a dog and don't <laughs> curl in front of me there's exactly obstacle, there's obstacle learning right now there is yeah walk next to me don't curve into me yeah as the i forget who said it but once somebody said you don't want to cross the finish line you want to own the finish line and that is very true right you want to be able to see it yeah um, and i think um, you know, a lot of newer, new trainers, new um, handlers, they don't see the end result. They can't see it in their mind's eye. And you well, they see the end to. result. They don't see the technical stuff that goes on to get to the end result. Right. Exactly. They just want the end result and everything right. else is considered puppy stuff. It, they'll grow out of it. Right. Sorry. And they won't. I think you're seeing a preview to the show that you're going to present yeah. two years of Dottie age. Dottie proves ankle biting lasts. All right. So I wanted to say that the um, what I when I said earlier the the um, you know the the preview that you're getting of biting of frustration barking blah 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 um, the preview is a preview to the show that's to come. I butchered how I said that, but that is a Jess Martin's saying. Jess Martin's is out of Canada. Um, she has great great information that she offers up to anybody that joins her Facebook page. Agility success. I think is what it's called or successful agility. Anyway, Jess Martin's out of Canada. Um, yes, she talks about the preview. What the behavior preview that you're getting is just a, a preview to the show that you're gonna get. So if you're getting bad behavior in practice, you're gonna get that bad behavior in a trial. And so I really like how she how she explained it. It's really good. So we've talked a lot about things that I don't like to do as puppies um, that I think that sometimes we push them further than we should in our training in in an effort to not only take advantage of their sponge brains and wear them out a little bit so that they're mentally happy and physically happy. But I'll, I, I do want to talk about w- things that I've been doing with Eli that can and should be a podcast all by itself. And so I I do want to do a podcast on all the foundation training that I have been doing. Did we not already do that? We did foundations aren't sexy. Yeah, we did, but like that wasn't that was for like dogs learning agility. Not like specifically puppy stuff. So we did do we did the foundations, but I want to really dive into what I've been doing. But he's only 14 weeks old. And so I think I need to hold off on that podcast until, you know, I continue to work them up towards six months, eight months, 10 months, because each month or every you know couple of months, it kind of adds a new stage of what I want to do with them. But these early weeks, months, I'm focused more on obedience than I am on agility skills, but the obedience Mm. directly influences what he's going to do in agility skills, right? Like obedience to me is not healing in healing focus. It's not competitive obedience. It's just basic obedience with an edge towards agility of stay at my side. Don't run past my hand. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I think puppy foundations and regular agility dog foundations are different, right? Because your people that come into your classes, right, they oftentimes they'll have adult dogs. And so those foundations are different. 
So what you're learning in foundations right now is not what you should be doing if you get a puppy, say. Um, and right. so puppy foundations are much different than agility foundations. Um, you know, bars, no bars, um, you know, no contacts, no weevils, um, you know, stuff like that. No, nothing hard on their bodies. Right. And all the obedience that I am doing with him, I expect that to be done in the obedience class, in puppy classes that people are taking elsewhere. Right. Like I don't teach obedience. I don't teach puppy classes for obedience. I don't even do, I've done a handful of puppy classes for agility. And if I did them again, I would do them differently now. Um, and I would do a heck of a lot more focus on obedience type stuff, impulse control. Um, then I would on, I mean, I would do a ton of, of body awareness stuff too. Mm. Right. So it would, um, just be body awareness stuff travel planks noise stuff that will help ready them for the teeters help ready them for just being you know neutral with noises uh, neutral with movement stuff right now in these early 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 stages i'm working a ton on obedience and impulse control with some trick training stuff in there but there are some tricks that i'm purposefully holding back on which i know he can completely do but i also know that it will kind of erupt things that i don't want him to do um and so i'm being very aware of what i want to introduce when right i think the bottom line is just safety Right. That is like the end all be all. Right. It's like it, it's really like, are, is this hard on your daughter's body, um, even if they don't tell you? And yes. Oh, maybe we shouldn't be doing that under the year under one. Year. Oh, my goodness. I can't talk. If yes, then maybe we shouldn't be doing that under a year old. But and so, yes. Yeah, so safety, growing bones and growing brain and growing mm. um, just mental ability to handle oneself in a high excitement uh, a time period right and like puppies get really really animated and excited when they're playing with toys and like over the top like oh my god it's a toy and they're so stinking cute about it too right they just like pounce funny and they they grab things that are really they just are so cute when they do it that you want to see it more and we giggle and we laugh and oh it's so cute but we have to be the adults in the room and we have to know what is safe for our dogs, even though they physically um, have the the ability to do it. They shouldn't be doing it. Right. Right. Like, yeah. And a lot of people say, well, well, what could be the issue? Right. My dog is big enough for this. So therefore, you know, they should be able to jump or whatever. And it's like, well, it might not show up right in the two when they're two, when they're three, when they're four. But when your dog hits six all of a sudden they're knocking bars all of a sudden they've got arthritis and you're like well wait a minute what's going on and it's because you know right. you made them do agility under a year old it, it really it deteriorates their joints and they won't be able to walk which is very depressing on this fun family podcast <laughs> um but there is an element of danger to agility that uh, gets overlooked quite a bit because puppies are just so cute well, and we so badly want to see them do equipment and the general Joe public isn't into the weeds of sit stay when they join an agility class. All right. I need to make my students do more sit stay work. <laughs> He's like, OK, I know you signed yeah. up for agility, but we're going to do obedience. That is the hard part of being an agility instructor is playing to the strengths of wanting to give people equipment time but also knowing that if i just hand them agility equipment out of the gate there's a serious risk to injury for the dog and being aware of that and working it as safely as possible for the dog and teaching the dog impulse control uh, around all this dangerous equipment all right yeah and the more high strung they are the harder it gets yeah. the harder yeah. it gets to control that and and you know i've been doing this a number of years and i have the odd dog that throws me a 
a curveball. We're like, whoa, how do we manage your body when you can't? How yeah. do we slow this exercise down when you want to go at warp speed? And it's tough. There's some dogs out there that really are high, high, high drive and slowing them down. Sometimes that's almost more dangerous. Yeah. Um, these are adult, not, not adult dogs, but young dogs that yeah. are at the age where they can start doing equipment and yet they're still, their bodies are so stinking yeah. big and, and gangly. That yeah. You see it in, in novice a lot, you know, the really young dogs that come in and they're just knocking bars left and right just because they don't know what their bodies are like anymore. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, fine balance, right. Of not letting your six month old, you know, run around doing, you know, height, height and jumps, but then also letting your, you know, 18 month old let loose a little bit. Yeah. Go get them listeners. I apologize profusely, but I am being called to dinner in three minutes. So <laughs> I will be leaving this podcast now. Um, All right. My friends say hello. <laughs> Maybe I'll get one on this podcast. See what an outsider thinks. So yeah, in, in case you didn't know, Emma's across the pond. Yeah, um, I'm at university right now. So. We are not sat in the same room together. Do we? we will be in two weeks, though. Isn't that exciting? That is exciting. We can podcast together. I'm very excited yeah. about that. Okay. Well, thanks, Sam, for chit-chatting with me about yeah. puppy stuff. And Yeah. Um, Puppies know. are fun. Oh, gosh. These are exciting. I oh. am having so much fun. He's Eli's cute. He is just, I just love him. I'm having yeah. so much fun with him. Yeah. He's a good All right. boy. Don't overtrain your dogs, young dogs. Don't overtrain your young dogs. Don't even overtrain your old dogs. Right. Right. Yeah. You got a you got a three, four year old. Are you overtraining them? Maybe that's a whole podcast. In oh itself. dear. Just keep coming up with them. My Especially goodness. if you're working hard, hard stuff like weed pulls and teeters. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, there's there's some benefit to doing it every day, but man, you can overdo it if if they're struggling. And with that, <laughs> um, thank you for listening to the Go Get Em Agility podcast. Go get em. Woo -woo. Go get em.